Right, that's the title of my sermon this morning, so I get that from the last part of the chapter of Jude. Pulling them out of the fire. So first of all, I just want to talk a bit about the fires that are going on in New South Wales. Just give you my perspective of what is uh, what may be happening and maybe give you the right perspective of how you should think about it. So honestly, my, my experience so far has been, you know, I've, honestly, I've been so busy uh, at work, I really have not given much attention um, to the fires just because this, this time of the year is, is, is very, very busy uh, for my line of work. But the fires are so bad, I mean, it's pretty hard to ignore them these days, isn't it? Because of the smoke and just the, the visual that we get of all the fires that are going on. And uh, the air condition, uh, I, I don't know about it, it's been like this in your area. In our area, it's been so bad that there, there are some times last year where the kids' sports classes got cancelled. Right? Well, there was one time where the, the soccer got called off because the air was too bad, and many times because there's not good ventilation where they do jiu-jitsu. That's been cancelled a couple of times too just because of the poor air conditions. But you know, it's pretty crazy what's going on, and like the fires that are happening. I mean, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite amazing when you... There were some days I got out to go to work and you know for the your neighborhood to smell like a campsite like in the morning after all the campfires have gone out uh, is a bit surreal and uh, you know the, the red skies the red sun and even driving to work and just not even being able to see uh, many blocks in front of you because of the smoke so honestly for myself you know i haven't really been engaged with the fires i, I hear a lot about them and i looked a bit up just for this sermon but you know, I didn't really real, realize how bad they were. And uh, you know, I've definitely never experienced anything like it before in terms of the clouds. But I have read that similar things have happened in the past. You know, there have been Black Sundays before that I've read about where really big fires have taken place. Uh, so it's not necessarily something new. Uh, but I, I personally think uh, there is a lot of political drive behind why it is so big in the media because there's a lot of talk about climate change and things like that so my honest my opinion and this is just my opinion you may have a different opinion to it is even though i'm not dang playing down the fact that people's lives have been affected and more than normal during bushfire season and i'm not saying obviously that we shouldn't get involved where we can you know i know even uh, there are people this morning going and volunteering and helping with drives and people donating money i'm, I'm all for that you know i'm all for helping where we can but m my opinion is i i don't think it's as bad as we think it is you know i think it is being blown up bigger than it actually is even though it's bigger than it r normally is uh because the reason why I think that is, you know, because the media loves a heart-moving story, right? And when tragedy strikes, like media gets onto it, and generally they, they blow things up bigger than they really are, and it's always more dramatic than the reality of it. And, you know, one thing I know, when you think about marketing, and you think about video making, and you think about telling a story, and things like that, you know, it's very easy to create a video with, like, moving images, or uh, we, you know, put along to music, and or show a series of photos that can paint a much bleaker picture than reality. And like I said, I'm not downplaying the fact that these things are actually happening, but if all you see when you look in your news feed and you read on the news is just pictures like this, and you know, people can string these together, and it just makes it seem worse than it really is. You know, in terms of bushfire season. So what I want to just remind you guys today that even though it is terrible and, you know, people are out of homes and, you know, we get images of these huge blazes going up and people having to relocate. Uh, this is a famous image as well. Of, uh, that's actually a boy, believe it or not. <laughs> this is a boy. But you know what I mean? I, I remember watching the interview of this boy and they're like, and he was re, like everyone, this, this image went viral and it became like the poster uh, post a child of the New South Wales fires that are going on and look how bleak it all is and then they interview the kid and, of the experience and he's like well, it wasn't that big a deal and uh, they're like asking about his the photo that went out and he didn't he didn't think too much of it himself even though here it's like oh you know this this emotional picture that's all red and everything like that so because 
this issue, and, I, and like I said, I think there is a, a political agenda behind it as well, because climate, you know, because now people are trying to blame, well, who's the cause for these fires? You know, is it the, is it the Greens or is it climate change? Is it because we are, we're breathing too much? There's too much carbon going out, the temperatures are changing, it's causing all these fires. So people are trying to point the finger, and I think that's why it's just been blown up so much, there's so much coverage, because it matches the agenda of people that are trying to push a certain narrative. And because it is so visible and there's so much media coverage, you know so much about it. And, the, and people know so much about it. So the more visible something is, the more people care about it, the more, you know, it's not like there are other, aren't other tragedies going on in the world. It's just this is the one you know about. Why? Because it's in your newsfeed. Because you see the photos. You hear people talking. It's just now it's, it's water cooler talk. But because it's, it's visible, that's why more people are aware of it. Think about 9-11. Why is 9-11 such a big deal? And I'm, I'm saying it's not a big deal. Well, it, you know, it's important. It was a tragedy that happened. But how many people died when the Twin Towers went down? 3,000. 3,000 died, right? And it's still every year. People talk about it. It's memorials. But, but why is it such a big deal? because it was visible, it was very visible. Right? Two twin towers in a metropolitan city, the you know, biggest city in, in America, everyone saw it happen. And that's why these 3,000 lives are so valued over so many other things that go on in the world. This is an image from, from WikiLeaks. This is an image from a video that WikiLeaks put out. If you don't know what WikiLeaks was, WikiLeaks became famous because they exposed a lot of the war crimes that were going on. So we mourn over 3,000 people's lives lost, you know, twin towers attacked by airplanes. And how many thousands and thousands of people's lives are killed every day in another country that you don't even know about? But where's the outrage there? Why? Because you don't know about it. But they want you to know about the fires and all this stuff's going, why? Because I don't know, climate change? Somebody's pushing a climate change agenda? There's an agenda, that's why there's so much coverage. But why are they trying to shut down organizations like WikiLeaks and Julian Assange has to be like over... And you know, maybe you think it's, you know, this is just all controlled opposition and everything like that. That's not my point here today. My point is just because you don't know about it. Now what was this, what, what made this video so, so famous is this video was a video of US Army people just killing citizens in another country like they were not even armed they were just standing around and yet this helicopter is just like gunning them down right and then they released this video to the public and that's when people there was outrage because now people know about it it's outrage but my point is when you don't know about it the outrage is not there the concern is not there so whilst i acknowledge the fact that these fires are probably bigger than normal they are bigger than normal and there's a lot of people's lives affected it is not as bad I think as you may think it is, you know, you may uh, be, be led to believe because, you know, you're getting that news feed, you're getting that constant flow of images, it's very heart moving, this is what the media lives and dies on and, and it's just a, a fact of life. You just have to be aware of it, that's all I'm saying. So don't get carried away when you hear about these things. Let's get really, you know, we should be passionate about like there are a lot of things to get passionate about. We can be passionate about this thing as well, but let's just make sure we think about it in perspective. Thousands of, are bombed every year overseas, but everyone cares just about 9-11. So how many, what, what's the statistics for New South Wales? I tried to look these up. I hope I have these somewhat right. But the, the count that I could find, just trying to look it up last night, was how many homes have been destroyed, many more homes have been affected, because we hear about even people in our own lives where they, they may be close to the fires, they may have had to get relocated, but they may not have necessarily lost their possessions yet. The number that I saw of houses that have actually been destroyed is around the 1500 mark. I don't know if I've got that wrong, hopefully I don't have that wrong, but that's what I read somewhere. It's about the 1500 mark. Now, if you put that in perspective, in New South Wales, there are three million homes. So, 
like I said, like we, we, make a, we, we look at 9-11, it's a really big deal, but 3,000 people, how many million people, compared to what? How many people are confirmed dead? Any of the guys know? Anyone want to take a guess? How many have died from the New South Wales fires? 30. 30? 119? I, I read that the toll, latest toll count was 17. So I don't know if I've got that right. Is it, is it higher? Maybe? Lower. <laughs> Lower. Okay, so yeah, so like I said, there's people missing, but confirmed dead, 17 people. So 9-11 was 3,000. But let me ask you. Another thing I want to say is, so you've got 1,500 homes destroyed, 17 people confirmed dead. Also, uh, you've probably seen a map like this. This is from a website called My Fires. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody posts something like this, saying Australia is on fire, I think this picture is a little bit misleading, right? Why is that? Because if you, if you think this dot re represents a location on a huge map, but when you, when you zoom out of this map, these locations become huge pins. It's like in Spotio as well. When you zoom out of the map, the, the pins just fill the map. So if you get the impression that, whoa, man, Australia is just on fire, you'd think like, man, here we are. Are we just like engulfed in flames? You know, just living in hell over here? No, because these fires are actually quite spread out. So you just have to remember, I'm just trying to bring you back to reality. I'm not trying to downplay the fact that people have been affected by these fires. But I don't want you to get carried away with the hype either that people want you to get carried away with. Because I do believe there's an agenda behind why they are pushing all you know, this, this fire information and, 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 and whatnot. So just remember, like an image like this is a little misleading because you know, when you zoom in, like I went to my fires, and when you zoom in to the Sydney metropolitan area, there's only like four locations in the, city, in the Sydney metropolitan area. So that's from eastern suburbs to where like Philippa lives. So a lot of these fires are happening in regional areas. A lot of the fires on this map, like a lot of people don't even live. This is just like wildlife areas and whatnot, like reserves. So 1,500 homes destroyed, many more affected, 17 people confirmed dead. But let me ask you, how many babies were killed last month in abortion? Where's the outrage there? Thousands. You know, in, in, in New South Wales alone, they estimate, you know, about 2,000 babies every month. It's every month. How many more times than the 17 that are dying just because of these fires? So, like I said, let's put it back in perspective and let's just know, let's just be real about the situation, understand that we have compassion, but let's put it in perspective as well. So why are people so outraged at the fires, so emotional about the fires, but not about things like this. <laughs> I just thought this meme really tells it well, because it's all part of the plan. You know, if you know this meme from the Joker in Batman, he's talking to, uh, who is he talking to, Two-Face, and he's saying like, hey, maybe he can say, well, if I told you last month, 2,000 babies were killed in the womb, nobody bats an eye. Why? Because it's all part of the plan. But if I tell you that 17 people's lives were lost in a, in a bushfire, then everybody loses their minds, right? So that's where this meme came from. It's just all part of the plan. That's why people don't freak out. So we should still, like I said, we should still do what we can to help in terms of donations and volunteers, obviously praying for them. You know, I think sometimes it's good to be aware of what's going on and the issues surrounding what's going on. But... Like I said, you don't necessarily want to be too carried away with the hype and just be real about and put it in perspective because people are trying to make you feel a certain way about this, right? So just be aware that the, there's a reason why the media is covering it so much um, and really pushing this narrative. So like with every tragedy that happens, everybody has their theories as to what is really going on behind the curtain. And my opinion is, I think there's likely a long list of factors that are coming together. 
and plus the media coverage that are, is fanning the emotional flames. But I think we would be well reminded today that there are many causes for why bad things happen. And we can reflect on the different causes as we look at them in the Bible and apply it to this situation. So there's a lot of suffering in this world. And like I said, not all of it is caused by God. And sometimes Christians are quick to push the button and say, ah, you know, this is God's judgment on Australia because of how wicked it is. And other people will say other things. And other people say other things. So we're going to talk about all these different causes. And I think it's a culmination of maybe a few of them. So let's talk about the first one. We'll look at a few verses and then we'll apply it to the fires that are happening in New South Wales. The first one is suffering can be caused by your own doing. It can be caused by your own doing. Galatians 6 verse 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So sometimes suffering is caused by your own doing. You have sown something and now you're reaping the consequences. I always like to think of the field of the slothful. I know we talk about this one a lot. It's one of my favorite proverbs. There's just a lot to learn from it. The proverb itself is Solomon walking by the field of the slothful and learning from it. I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof and the stone wall thereof was broken down. So just note that because I want to come back to that. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. So let's think about the fires, for example. What can be one reason why there is suffering with the New South Wales fires that are going on? Well, one is, and you know, this may not be popular, this may sound unsympathetic, but one thing is people, sometimes people decide to live in a high risk area. And if they live in a high risk area and they decide to live that lifestyle, then obviously there are consequences that can happen from living that lifestyle. So for example, if some people decide to buy a house on the coast, you know, right next to the cliffs and, you know, they got, they got the beach view and, oh, it's beautiful, right? And then what happens when there's a flood? Well, their house gets destroyed, doesn't it? But nobody, nobody forced them to live by the coast. That's something that they decided. They decided, hey, I'm going to live by the coast. They have to realize you're living in a high-risk area. Maybe there's going to be floods and monsoons or cyclones, things that can destroy your house. And if you live out there, that's something that must be dealt with. Now, it's no different to people that decide, you know, they love the outback. They love living amongst the bush. There's no problem with that. If people want to live amongst the bush. They want to live along, amongst the trees. They don't like the urban jungle, you know, where it's just house upon house upon house of steel and fake trees or planted trees that, you know. If they live in that area, they obviously have to be aware that when bushfires happen, your house is at risk. You know, if your house is on the backing of a bush and there's bushfires, that you want to enjoy that bush, then obviously you have to live with the consequences as well. So sometimes when you think, oh, because bushfires happen all the time, guys. It's not like this year all of a sudden there's these bushfires that have never bushfires before. That's why they call it bushfire season. So bushfires are always happening. People that live in the bush are aware of it. So they have to prepare for it. They have to think, okay, let's make sure our house is protected. Let's make sure we don't live too, I don't want to live too close to the bush. You know, maybe I'll have to evacuate because of the smoke or everything, but my house will still be safe because I'm far enough away from the bushfires. So that is something, that is one way suffering can be caused on ourselves. When we think about the field of the slothful, now, I'm not saying, like I said, we're just talking about reasons why people may be affected by the fires. I'm not saying this is for everybody. But one could be, if you think about the field of the slothful, this is one way somebody can bring, you know, suffering on themselves, is that they haven't maintained their property. They've let it grow over where the trees are out of control, maybe the, 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 the trees have fallen over, there's a lot of grass that hasn't been cut. So when the fire season comes, they haven't done their due diligence and in terms of doing the controlled fires, 
where they burn off an area and maintain the burned off area so when the fires come it doesn't creep over into their property. So that can be a way suffering can happen just from somebody's maybe their own laziness or they haven't been diligent enough or they haven't done the controlled fires in order to protect their property. That is one way the suffering can be caused by their own. So do you know the situation of everybody in these fires? You know, like with every tragedy, and it's like it's like with vaccines as well. You know, you get some. It's like you know, supposedly like two people. My wife was telling me two people found on the beach. They had measles. And it's like, oh, you know, measles. I mean, do we know why that? Did they actually have measles? I mean, did anyone die from it? There are questions that need to be asked. So some just. I'm not saying, and like I said, I'm going to repeat myself because I don't want people to think that I don't care about the fires, that I don't think they're not important. What I'm saying is that when we hear the news, are you as a believer, as you that's somebody that knows the truth and ought to be sober about what's going on in the world, do you look at it through that lens and think, okay, I've heard about the number of homes, heard about the number of people who died. What's their situation? Why are their homes so affected? Where were they living? What, where are these fires happening? Or do we just look at a map with red dot and just think like, oh man, this country's just up in flames. You know? So let's just be sober and think about this. Number two is suffering can be caused by other people. So it can be intentional suffering. And this is where a lot of the argument is in politics right now. Is who is to blame for these fires happening? Right? Who caused them? Like, why are they the way they are? And, and if you're aware of what's being talked about in the political sphere, you can see there are two factions going on. One saying, you guys caused this climate change and this is why it's so hot. These are all the bushfires. But I don't know if you're aware of the other side. You know, I'm seeing some posts now in my feed. I don't know if you're seeing them in your feed where they're saying, hey, well, it's the environmentalists. Like the one, and I'm not saying we shouldn't take care of the environment. I'm saying the people pushing this green agenda and the policies that they've put in place, they're actually the ones that have caused the reason why these fires are so big this season. Well, let's look at some verses first. James 4, when we look at suffering that's caused by man's doing, right, by the, by the sins of others. From whence come wars and fightings among you? We were just looking at the WikiLeaks picture before. Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not, because you ask not. Very famous one, 1 Timothy 6, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So we apply it to this situation that we see today with the New South Wales fires, and I guess many fires that are happening around the country uh, that we know about, people have many different theories why these are happening. You know, conspiracy theories are coming up, right, where people say, hey, you know, there's these, these guys behind it, they're manufacturing the weather. You know, I saw some of you guys post on Facebook, geoengineering. Is there some of that going on? Maybe. Right? Maybe. But what I'm trying to say today is there could be many factors at play. It doesn't have to be just one answer. People are saying, well, geoengineering, is there a conspiracy to dry out the country? You know, try and control water supplies. That's one political reason people are talking about. What if it's just a bunch of organized arsonists just wanting to create havoc? Maybe they've watched one too many Batman movies and they idolize the Joker and they just want to be an agent of chaos, right? And they just get together now on social media and they're just like, why don't we just start a fire here, start a fire there? What if that's part of it too? You know, there's a culmination of factors and then these fires start and because of the weather as well, it's just been getting worse. A bit of the geo, throw a bit of geo, geoengineering in there and it's just making, you know, these bushes go up in flames. I mean. Do you know? I mean, I know there's been a lot of talk in the news about just people just starting fires and people hoping that they will be arrested. This is what I was talking about with the Greens movement. I've been seeing posts like this. This is one posted by somebody I knew. 
You can see it's uh, at Richard Di Natale, he's leader of the Greens, and obviously Scott Morrison. Look what he says here, thanks to all the Greens that have expanded our national and state parks. Thanks to all the Greens who have reduced controlled burns. So I'd, I'd be interested to see, I mean, this makes a lot of sense that they would do these things. Thanks to the Greenies who chained themselves to trees to get media attention. Thanks to the media for giving them prime time to achieve their goals. I won't read the whole thing, but the crux of the issue here is he's saying there's a lot of Greens policies that have made people not be able to, you know, expand national parks, not been able to do controlled burns, not been able to collect firewood and things like that. And that's the reason why, a lot of people believe that is the reason why the fires are so big this year. Because of all the green and the climate change policies that have gone in and people not being able to touch, not being able to cut down trees on their own property to protect themselves from these fires. I read this quote, this was a, uh, an article in, uh, I can't remember what, what article I was reading it in. And I'll just read one paragraph from this one, the middle paragraph. And if this is true, if this is the reason why the fires are so big, I just find it very ironic. <laughs> Look what he says here, but what's the point of that? Now, what, what's the point of that now? When the hills and the trees, they told me I couldn't burn off, this is a farmer. Right? Because they were protected eagles and swift parrots there. And now all burned and the fire it created was so hot, we had dead swans dropping out of the sky. So if that is the case, that green policies have caused such a huge fire, don't you just find that so ironic that they have tried to protect wildlife and in doing so, they've created the biggest infernos that New South, New South Wales has ever seen. Is that it? It could be a multitude of factors. But before you so quickly jump on one, just consider the many reasons that it could be. It could be a multitude of factors coming together. What about satanic influence? You know, Christians are very quick to say God is judging Australia for things that are going on uh, right now, all the fires that are going on. How do you know it's God? How do you know it's not Satan starting these fires? To get people to blame God for what is going on. Look at Job 1. When we talk about natural disasters, I like always going to Job 1 to, to, so, to show, hey, you know, it's not only God that creates natural disasters. Satan is able to as well. Job 1, 16. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the fire of God is fallen from heaven. Now, if you remember the story of Job where Satan went to Job, and said, hey, he's going to test Job. Satan is now going to do these things. But when the servants come back to report to Job what has happened to his property and his loved ones and his servants, what does he say? The fire of God is fallen from heaven. So you see here there's a natural tendency to just point to God when natural disasters happen. But that's not always the case. And with the fires in New South Wales, could it have been Satan's act? Could it have just been man's act? It could have been a multitude of factors. But I wouldn't be so quick just to pin it on God. And it burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Man, doesn't that remind you of what we are experiencing now in New South Wales? Job 1, 19. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness. So again, this was Job. Oh, this was Satan creating this natural disaster but what does the servant say he says behold there came a great wind from the wilderness mother nature just did it and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead and i only have escaped alone to tell thee so when we think about the new south wales wales fires and you think okay well the extreme heat that is going on is it climate change? Is it just Satan? Just causing extreme heat in a certain area so that it'll fan the flames of the fire? What about, do you think it's possible if, if Satan can send a strong wind, he can send fire from heaven, 
do you think it's possible for him to prevent rain in a certain area? Possible, right? If it, if it plays into the things he wants to do, he want, the ways he wants people to think. You know, it's no different to tsunamis and cyclones in certain areas. People will say it's an act of God. But, you know, we can see already that Satan is able to send natural disasters. You know, I think about recently there was a volcanic eruption where people, a certain tourist island, and people were caught up in that volcanic eruption. You know, was that God? You know, it could have been Satan that caused that at that particular time, knowing that it would get into the news. Who knows? But the point of this sermon this morning is that there is a lot of different factors that play into account when we look at natural disasters. The last one we want to look at is in Acts 5. Can God create natural disasters? Can he cause things to happen? I think it's possible. But I'll give you some thoughts here this morning. Acts 5. This is talking about when Ananias and Sapphira lied to the church about how much they gave. But Peter, and Ananias, but Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While is it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down, gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. So God here caused the death of Ananias. So God can, can obviously do things that affect our lives. And when it comes to the lives of believers, sometimes we have to remember that he does it out of love. Hebrews 12. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now, a lot of people are saying as well that, you know, this is God's judgment on Australia because of ungodly things that have been passed. Now, my position is, I don't personally believe that bad things that happen today are a result of God's judgment. You know, yeah, there is a lot of preaching in the Old Testament about God judging the land, judging the nation of Israel, judging this country and judging that country. But I personally believe, well, my position is that that was the way God dealt with nations in the Old Testament. I don't believe God deals with nations the way he did in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, I believe in these last days, you know, with Jesus Christ dying and rising again, God is dealing with mankind differently. And I think what we can learn from those passages is an example and a foreshadowing of what is going to come when God pours out his wrath on the one world nation. That's what I think. That's what we learn from it. Because if God is pouring out his wrath on Australia today because of, you know, let's say the marriage debate or the, the abortion law that was passed, well, then that raises questions in my own mind. Like a question is, well, why Australia? When there are other nations significantly more wicked than ours that are not burning right now, that are living in prosperity, that are living in peace. And you say, well, it's because we passed the gay marriage and we passed the abortion debate. And what you've got to realise is, you know, those debates that we were having just in the last year or two were like the tail end of a movement that has been going on for decades. You know, people are getting married for decades. I mean, it's not like there's just this one thing that changed and then therefore God is all of a sudden angry with Australia. So why wasn't it happening before? And then you've got to ask the question, is there a reason why the tragedies are being blown up more than they should be? Is there an obvious alternate cause? These are the things I think about before I'm just quick to say, hey, is it God that is causing these things? And think about this. If after the fires have gone, let's say we have a couple of weeks, you know, a couple of days of rain. All the fires are put out, it's under control, and then we just have you know, Australia just on the up and up, prosperous, peaceful. Are you going to take back your words of how God was judging, <laughs> you know, God judging Australia and just so angry he's destroying it when things are going well? So... My position is, I think it's hard to be dogmatic on the reasons bad things happen these days. I don't think 
the biblical support. Because if you think about the, the judgment verses that people go to, to say God is going to judge a physical land, they have to go to the Old Testament, right? Because the only other place you see it is in Revelation. And why? Because that's when God actually pours his wrath out on the physical. So I personally believe, like I said, God dealt with mankind differently in the Old Testament because it was setting a picture of what was going to happen. That's why he dealt with Israel a bit differently. And you can't always think, well, because he did this for Israel, this is what, you know, he did that to Israel, this is what he's going to do to God's people because you'll misunderstand as well, right? So there's a picture of things happening in the future. You have to understand the Old Testament in light of the New Testament. So I don't personally believe God works that way today. And like I said, it just raises too many questions. I mean, there's too many ungodly things happening that are not being dealt with. So the question is, why? Well, it's because I think it's talking about end times. And likewise, in the Old Testament, you see nations living ungodly for a long time and not being judged because I believe as well that it was a picture of God, you know, being graceful. Because if he actually held to his covenant to a T and if people did not keep his commandments, every nation would have been wiped out in the Old Testament because nobody kept God's commandments. Right, so why were there even God's blessings? Why can David even talk about God's blessings in the Old Testament? It's because of God's mercy, just like now. One day, that time will be up. And that's why if we think of anything, when we think about the fires, the fires are tragic. You know, these days have been really hot. But we have to be reminded, and even Nathan was thinking about this morning when he prayed, hell is a lot hotter. So that's why this ought to drive, this ought to remind us, hey guys, we have to get involved in the soul winning. Because like we, hey, we're so passionate about helping people get out of the fires, helping people, you know, protect their property. What about helping people to protect their very souls? Getting them out of the fires of hell. Where's your passion there? You know, if you're getting passionate and go, oh man, I'm watching this video, my eyes are crying. Where are the tears for the people dying and going to hell? That's why I'm trying to get us back, our perspective back. Because we get so carried up with what the media is feeding you that you're forgetting about the bigger picture. That there is a bigger fire coming and who are going to be the firefighters that are going to get into that fight. And I thought this was fitting for today because it's a new year. I'm sure people are making a lot of resolves, going to do something different this year. Guys, it's time to get back into soul winning. You know, a lot of you have dropped the ball, you know, not soul winning for a while. We've got to get back into it, guys. It's time to get back into the soul winning. Have compassion. Make a difference. Pull people out of the spiritual fire. We've got to knock those doors. Why do we knock doors? I know I talk about this before. I talk about it, I talk about it when I talk about soul winning. Why are we so into door knocking? You say, like, oh, Victor, that's not the only method there is for evangelism, why are we, why are we so, why, why the door knocking? You know, you know it makes me feel com uncomfortable, makes them feel, you know, just, just realize, guys, any evangelism method makes people uncomfortable. Don't think there are like some, you know, the, the ones that don't make them uncomfortable are probably the ones they're not even looking at. You know, like you can make a video, you put all this advertising out, they're not uncomfortable with it because they just ignore it. But, you know, no amount of advertising and no amount of like content creation, all that stuff, can reach the person across the street if they don't want to look at it. But you know what? If we go over there and knock on their door, that will give us a better chance. If we open a soul winner, spill with the spirit of, spirit of God, with the boldness of God, going over there, not seeing in their home, and actually opening a Bible and trying to engage them. You know, because they can ignore a billboard. They can turn off the feed. But you know, when you come knocking on their door, that's, that's a chance for them to be warned of the fires that are coming. That is harder for them to ignore. Right? That's why. And we can systematically reach everyone. Because like I said, you can put out advertising and invite people to a gathering to try and preach the gospel to them. But nothing can compare. Like I said, you go to them. You go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that's why we do door-to-door -door soul winning, because that's where the people are. That's where we're going, out in the highways and hedges. Now a question, a question 
that people ask when we talk about soul winning, I just thought I'd cover this, is we read in Romans 10, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And people will say, if you don't go to preach the gospel, people will go to hell. And that is true to a certain extent. But I want you to understand how this works, because I've been thinking about this, because uh, this is something that I've always wondered about too. I'll share my thoughts with you this morning. Because people will ask the question, if we need to go out and preach the gospel for people to be saved, does that mean people are going to hell because of my laziness? I'm, I'm in sin, I don't care about the things of God, and literally people are out there, they don't know about the gospel, and they are going to hell because of my laziness. And I know that preach as well, because it makes people feel guilty, and it gets people to go. But I don't know whether that's the full truth. Because, think about it, isn't it a little bit unfair that somebody doesn't hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, not because of any of their own doing, it's because, because you were too lazy. Because you were too lazy. Because you decided on Sunday afternoon, instead of going soul winning, you decided go to a family gathering, go watch a movie, go, go to the beach, go lazy about at home in your air-conditioned home, but somebody now has to spend an eternity in hell. Right? To me, that seems a little bit unfair. So, how does it, how does it work? So then the thought is, well, that's why God gets the gospel to everybody. And we read further down in Romans 10, but I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily their sound went into all the earth and their words until the ends of the world. So God, does God use his people to get the gospel out? Yes. But does God make sure everyone gets a chance to hear? I do believe so. I believe yes. Everyone gets a chance to hear. So they know. But then the question is, if the gospel gets out to everybody, well then what's the point of going soul winning? That's the Calvinist thought, right? The Calvinist thought is, well, if they're going to get the gospel anyway, whether I go out or not, and I'm just like the Calvinist, I'm just doing it because I'm commanded, but I don't actually believe I make a difference, then there would be no point to going soul winning. So why bother going soul winning? Why bother going soul winning if they're going to hear the gospel anyway? Well, here's the answer. Here's what I think the answer is. Because there is still time to change their mind. That's why it makes a difference. Because there's still time, because the fires of hell, have, they're, not, they're not dead yet. Even though they know, they might have heard it, they might have put it out of their mind, they might have ignored it, so they're not without excuse. They will go to hell knowing that they had a chance. But you know what? There's still time to change their mind. And that's why the Bible says oh, some have compassion making a difference. Because it requires some compassion for somebody that has even rejected God already. Has already had the opportunity to say and plead with them and think, please man. Let me try and convince you. Listen to me so that you will not go to hell. And that's this experience, right? When we go out soul winning, I already know. Well, maybe we have an opportunity for them to hear so we can change their mind before it's too late. Second Peter 3. Familiar verses to us, but think about them in a different light now. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. Look at this but is long-suffering to us, word. What does that mean? He's giving people time to repent. They have time to change their mind of something they've already been given the opportunity to accept. But he's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all 
holy conversation and godliness. I'll tell you what sort of person we ought to be. Somebody with some compassion. It makes a difference, like we read in Jude. And if some have compassion, making a difference. Now I know, you know, like I know, I know you're scared of soul winning. I used to be scared of soul winning too. I've been doing it so long, the fear is not really a, an issue for me anymore. But I know you're scared, you know, I was scared too. You know, that's why we make excuses. People make excuses, I'm busy and whatnot, but you know, some people, they're just scared. I know you're lazy. I am too. That is what I struggle with now. You know, I know how you feel. I know how it feels to be lazy. I know how to be in bed on Sunday morning. I'm very acquainted with being in bed on Sunday morning and not wanting to come here on Sunday morning. I'd rather just sleep and stay in bed, especially when you've been up very late at night. And that's why you'd rather be somewhere else on a Sunday afternoon. But you know what? If more of us went soul winning, you know, we already have a core group. We have enough people. You can just start. You don't have to worry about what you're going to say. Just come as a silent partner. You know, silent partners, you know how much difference a silent partner can make? If I have four soul winners and we have four silent partners, you say, oh, you know, there's already four people go soul winning. They know what they're doing. Those four people will put in two pairs and they'll reach one block. But if we have four silent partners to go with those four soul winners, we will double the amount of houses we reach. Double. So that's why don't, don't downplay the fact of what a soul winner does. Soul winner allow, a, a silent partner allows us to create more pairs of people to go out. Right? So don't, don't think just because oh, I don't know what to say, I don't go. No, you go as a silent partner and you will directly affect the number of houses we reach today. Now let's compare this to the fires. Let's get back to that thought of well, we have time to change their mind. You know, the Bible says, others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. So it works the same way in the New South Wales fires. Think about it. Let's say you're in a house where the fire is just coming. Everybody knows that fire is coming. It's like the gospel. God's judgment is coming. The word is out there. People know it's coming. But what happens with people in the fire? Some people don't even, they ignore the news. They ignore the alerts. They think, well, I'll be fine. What do other people do? I'm going to stay, and I'm, not, I'm not saying these are the wrong things to do in an actual physical situation. I'm just trying to compare it to the spiritual. Some people, they stay back of their own might, right? And they're like, I'm going to protect my house. And they get their garden hose and they're up against the blaze. And you think about how futile that is. That's like trying to work your way to heaven. That's the work salvation. But then you've got the firefighters going in saying, look, we're giving you the warning. They come back again. Look, the fire's coming. Get out. This is your chance. That's what the soul winner is like. The soul winner is like the firefighters going in. They already know the fires are coming but they know that those people are not going to be able to protect their homes with their own works, with their own garden hose. So we get in there to warn people and say, now's your chance to get out while you're still alive. So that's why the Bible says of some have compassion, making a difference. Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. So maybe there are different reasons why the fires are happening. We talked about them today. Well, maybe one reason is, is because it's a reminder for you guys of the fires that are coming. And we need to be the spiritual firefighters out there telling people about the fires to come. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much uh, for suffering in our lives. Lord, you tell us to be thankful in all things, not just for all things. And Lord, we feel for those who are affected by the fires. Lord, I'm not downplaying the tragedy that is happening. Lord, I'm just trying to put it in perspective. And I pray, Lord, that we would always keep things in perspective. And Lord, we would always see why things happen. And Lord, may we learn the lessons uh, for why you've allowed it to happen. I pray, Lord, for the firefighters on the front line pray that you'll keep them safe. I pray, Lord, that you give people wisdom to know when to flee or when to stay and 
try and protect their homes. But Lord, I pray for the church here and I pray that uh, if at anything, Lord, we'd be reminded of the fires of hell that are coming our way. And Lord, help us to be those spiritual firefighters. Send your laborers into the harvest, Lord. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.